Hi, my name is Arthur Vinci. I'm a writer, director, and producer. And today we'll be discussing how to spend money smartly uh, when you are setting up and running your film and TV business. When you are first starting out uh, in the freelance world especially, you will be tempted to spend a lot of money on a lot of things that you will probably not need. There will be no end to companies that will want to part you from your money promising great things. Hey, uh, you can come to this networking event for $20 a pop and you'll meet lots of people who will give you lots of access to lots of things. There's also no end of equipment vendors who want you to spend lots of money on their toys. Some of those things are really essential and some are just not. There's something you need to ask yourself before you spend money on anything related to your business. Number one, do I really need this to run my business? Number two, can I amortize the costs over a reasonable period of time? In other words, if I buy a camera now, will I be able to book enough jobs to pay for the cost of buying the camera uh, over the course of, let's say, three years? Number three, will it help me get clients? Uh, now, these are conflicting questions because something may help you get a client but may not uh, pay, help you pay for the cost of the equipment. So sometimes you may have to sit down and really have a discussion with yourself about what do I really need this gear. When you're buying something that's more amorphous like a service, like somebody is offering to take your headshots for you or cut a trailer for you for your, for your work or build your website, is this something that you can do on your own? Is this something that if you did for yourself would be taking away too much time from going off and chasing paying work? And number three, would the results be as good as if you uh, let a professional, you know, an expert in that field do it? Now, again, there's no simple answer to those questions. Uh, it may be that you have some flair for web design and you can set up your website in Squarespace, which we'll talk about in a second, and it's gonna look great. On the other hand, you may have no flair at all for say business card design and everything you do kind of looks like messy garbage. Um, and that's fine because not everybody can do a bit good business card. It's actually really hard to do one. Um, so it may make more sense to hire somebody who does corporate logos and business cards for a living and let them do the work for you so that you can then go and chase after business, uh, which is what you should be doing. So let's start by talking about some things that I think are essential for any business to run properly. In addition to making films, I happen to have a background in IT I have built my own computers, I have upgraded and replaced parts, and I've also made a living as a computer programmer. So I have some advantages in this area. Obviously, you need a good computer. Now, when you are buying a computer, what you want to think about is what's called the total cost of ownership. That doesn't just include the purchase price, but it also includes the interest rate on whatever credit card you are putting the purchase on, unless you can afford to pay cash, the cost of upgrading and maintaining the computer over the course of three years, let's say, the cost of downtime, and that's a little trickier to estimate, due to you know excessive computer crashes or other problems. So one way to make this total cost of ownership formula kind of simple is to think about all of the things that you're going to need your computer for for the next three years. Email, obviously, word processing. Uh, you're gonna need some kind of basic spreadsheet. Ideally, you also wanna be keeping your books for your business, so you know, using QuickBooks or some other accounting software. You're going to probably have to edit photos and maybe do some uh, vector graphics work to build your business card and uh, your website. Chances are you're gonna edit video uh, even if you are not actually primarily focused on the video end of the film and TV business, like let's say, again, you're a sound designer or you're a composer, you will probably have to cut your own reel together. So that's just a short list of application types that you're going to be running on your computer for the next three years, let's say. And are those going to be satisfied by something that's kind of at the bottom of the line? Or is it wiser to spend a little more money now 
and get something that is going to not need a whole lot of upgrades over the course of its lifetime. So for that reason, I often recommend people, especially if they're not super tech savvy, to go Mac because even though the cost of a new machine is you know many times more than what you would pay for a Windows machine, the total cost of ownership starts to go down as you look at the life cycle of these machines. Like I have a cheese grater Mac that I bought in 2010. I've upgraded it a few times. I put in a USB 3 card and eSATA card and I jacked up the RAM from eight gigs to 32 gigs. But basically it is the same machine that I started with and I'm still editing video with it. In fact, uh, you know, I recently have been cutting 4K video with it. It's slower than a brand new Mac would be with brand new processors, but it still holds its own. My spouse's laptop uh, MacBook Pro made it about nine and a half years. I did have to crack the case and put in a new battery and uh, more RAM at one point, but basically it it survived much longer than my typical uh, Windows uh, laptops do. My Windows laptops, I tend to go for the middle to low end of the spectrum because I'm doing most of my heavy work on the Mac. So consequently, I look at these laptops as more disposable and I tend to get about two to three years of use out of them. I've never gotten five years out of any of the Windows laptops I've had. The other thing is that as your computer gets older, you may find yourself spending more time doing the same ta kinds of tasks or doing more advanced tasks. That is something that unfortunately happens to everybody, you know, so again, I can now edit, I can edit 4K video on my Mac tower, but it is not, uh, you know, not super fast. And at a certain point, if I was making a living as an editor and I was doing, or like a visual effects person, I would have to be asking myself, is this eating into my profit margin? Because the time I'm spending uh, waiting for things to render, I, some of that I may not even be able to charge back to my client. So maybe I need to upgrade my machine so that I can work more efficiently. I can take on more work. For uh, a laptop, you want to maybe get the middle of the line model. Um, and if you're going for a desktop, I would say, especially since desktops are a lot cheaper, um, go for um, the higher end model. The Mac, the Mac Pro Tower now, I don't think is a very good buy for most people. I think that is just too freaking expensive. That's that's where I kind of draw the line. iMacs are much better, uh, a much better value proposition than they were, say, even a few years ago. Another thing that you're going to want to spend some money on is antivirus software. Um, I have tried free stuff and I've tried paid stuff and I ended up settling on Norton, even though it's nobody's favorite. But the various Norton antivirus products that are out there, I feel like do the most consistent overall job of grabbing, uh, of intercepting malware and uh, getting rid of uh, viruses. Other people swear by other software programs. It's certainly worth shopping and comparing. For Macs, I am a big fan of Clam XAV. I feel like Clam XAV does a really good job. All it takes is for one uh, virus to get on your machine and just ruin your day. And not just your day, but maybe your week. And, you know, And that's time that you're not going to be able to bill back to your clients. The other thing is you're going to want to have some kind of backup plan. Now this could be anything from Time Machine for Mac, which I think is really excellent, to something as simple as what I have for my laptop, which is I have a couple of external hard drives that I back up to regularly using a very simple program called Rich Copy. It takes a look at what's on the my drive and what's on the external drive and copies over anything that's changed or been added. I wanted to keep it super simple. I'm not a huge believer in cloud backups, but I have backed up critical files to my Dropbox account. Whatever strategy you pursue in terms of backing up your stuff, you want to make sure that A, it is the backup is secure, and B, that you can retrieve stuff from the backup. You know, you should do a, tr a test run at least once to make sure that you can find something that you didn't mean to delete, let's say. Now, when, we, when we're talking about software, there are free and paid options. 
and I think it's at least worth considering the free stuff. There's OpenOffice and LibreOffice that are both fantastic packages that offer the equivalent of Word and Excel and PowerPoint um, and will do you just fine. If you are looking for some an alternative to Photoshop, uh, GIMP is great. Uh, it's open source. It's cross-platform. I use it periodically. I also use Photoshop. So if you are just starting out in your 3D education, I recommend Blender. It is not the easiest program to learn to use, but again, it's free. Most of the concepts that you learn in Blender will apply to whatever 3D program you end up using. I also recommend Resolve. There's a free version of Resolve. There's also the studio version, which is, I think is like $300 right now. It's an excellent program. It runs on Mac and PC. If you're working as part of a shop or part of a team, you or you want to adhere to industry standards, you may be locked in to some extent into purchasing something. If your clients are an Avid shop, then you're going to probably have to get an Avid license. So you may have to buy software to work with a team and to plug yourself into a team. It's worth talking to other people who are a few years ahead of you in the business to find out what they use. And again, like I said, like even if your main component of your business is not video editing, if your business is sound mixing or you're a hair and makeup artist, let's say, you may have to cut a reel together at some point. So you might as well have some tools at your disposal. You may not have to buy them right away. A couple other things that you should be thinking about spending money on, one is some kind of accounting package. Uh, it could be QuickBooks. It could be Quicken if you're just running everything out of your personal bank account. If you're not incorporated, I did a whole episode on incorporation. Um, there's a lot of advantages to QuickBooks, even though I'm not the hugest fan of QuickBooks. You know, I hate the fact that Intuit keeps forcing me to buy upgrades to their program, even though they offer me very little in terms of useful features. But, you know, it is a way to keep track of my business expenses. The other thing is that a lot of accountants use QuickBooks. If you have an accountant, you should talk to your accountant about what he or she uses and make sure that you're using something that can work with that standard. If you're going to be serious about working in this field, you're going to want to get an IMDB Pro account. Along with the uh, normal sort of filmographies and bios and all that, and those publicity photos and all that for all the people listed in IMDb. They also have contact information. So they're agents and managers. Uh, they have company listings. So like if a company, a production company, you can find out what their address is, what their email and website address is, and who works for them. You can basically set up a resume page for yourself, uh, you know, a portfolio page for yourself. So it, I think it's definitely worth it. And I certainly have been able to do more effective research than if I had to go hunting down like what manager or what agent represented this actor that I'm trying to get the script to. I also really like Dropbox. On the one hand, Dropbox's upload and download speeds are abysmal and I wish it supported some kind of regular old FTP client, but you know, it does what it does and everybody kind of uses it. It's become a standard for having large, you know, for sharing large files. It's worth upgrading from like whatever the paltry free, subs free subscription gets you to like the first or second paid tier. I, I believe I pay about 10 or 11 a month for it. I pay for a Vimeo subscription. Um, I find Vimeo to be a really great tool for building portfolios. I also post drafts of things that I want people to review. I have the uh, Pro account, uh, which gives, which is like, I think 200 a year. And that gives me the ability to create collections and uh, create like a, a page. So I have my reel and stuff up there. You know, has it generated any work? I know that I have uh, my last feature is up there and the web series is up there both on, on their own on-demand pages and they've both generated a little bit of revenue. But I know that, that working without uh, a Vimeo Pro subscription would make my life a lot more difficult in terms of being able to fa share files with others. This is the truth about marketing is that 80% of your work is going to come from 20% of your contacts, but you don't know where that 20% sits. Now, I, business cards seem like they are 20th century. 
but the truth is that they are still very much in use. And I am always shocked when I go to a networking meeting and people don't have a business card to give me. And they're like, well, you just, you know, I'll text you. The, the thing is that that's great, but uh, the tra chances of me remembering you in the sea of emails I get every day or texts I get every day is a lot less than if I have a physical thing I can hold. You know, I come home from networking events and festivals with a stack of cards. Out of those hundreds of cards uh, that I accumulate in a given year, how many of those people am I going to stay in touch with again? Probably about 10 to 20%. And that's that's a good ratio. But I will say that out of those 10 or 20 percent, some of them I've been in touch with now and have worked with for more than 10 years. You want to get a good business card designed. Good doesn't mean that it has to be super duper flashy, but it does have to communicate your basic information very clearly. I am a big fan of the newest twist, which is putting the... Um, the smart code on the business card. If you're not good at doing graphic design work, and again, not everybody is, it's worth at least looking at hiring somebody who is good at graphic design. It's a very undervalued skill right now, unfortunately, but it really is a skill, a separate skill. I also feel that there are certain online services that are more, you know, have more competitive pricing than others. Some people love Moo. I happen to think that they're overpriced. Other people love PS Print. I kind of dig them. Whatever you decide, do some comparison shopping to make sure you're getting a good price. One thing I don't recommend is printing your own business cards at home. It never looks good. I'm also not a huge fan of those tiny little business cards. That's just me. I Square ones are really nice. The vertical ones are nice. The, the standard size are nice. Those little tiny ones I think are kind of useless. This is 2020 and everybody's got a website, uh, you're going to want something that works as a kind of portfolio for your work, whatever your work in the film and TV business is. And you may even have like a client centric section of your site where clients can preview work in progress, you know, through a log, through a secure login. So there are different options out there, and I would say if you're not like web design savvy, like if this is not something you do a lot of, that um, a perfectly good solution is to go with Squarespace. Um, they are not the cheapest thing out there, but what they are doing for you in exchange for the money you're paying them is taking care of the work to create and maintain a site. And maintenance, by the way, is a big part of this. Um, it's not good enough to just create your brochureware site and leave it up there. You have to invest a little bit of time in maintaining it. And if you create your own site through WordPress or Wix, I think once every three years I go through a major revamp, you know, to keep up with the current standards in web design and also make sure that my site is readable on different devices. So if you don't want to go with Squarespace, uh, what you want to find is a reasonably priced shared Linux hosting plan. I think the Linux hosting plans on average are cheaper than the Windows host, uh, hosting plans. You also will need to register your domain name and make sure that your hosting plan includes at least a couple of email addresses for free. You know, you'll have to do the work of setting up, you know, a WordPress site and picking out a template and experimenting a bit. It takes a long time to get any website completely you know, 100% to where you want it. Again, if you're not a graphic design person or not a web design person, you may want to at least bring in somebody to look over your design. The main thing for me about web design and websites is that I have to be able to find the information I need very quickly. You know, I don't want to have to like dig through 20 links to get to your email address or your contact information. There should be a way to contact you on every single page. And it's crazy to me how many websites ignore that basic idea. It's good to study websites in other sectors of business that really have figured all this out. For some strange reason, a lot of film sites are really behind the curve on this. And maybe it's because, you know, it's exhausting to run a business and to, to spend time updating your website on top of that sucks. And I know that because it does. But the truth is, is that, you know, authors have figured out a sort of standard. It's pretty consistent from author to author. You know, you have a bio page, you have a works page, uh, you have some kind of a contact page. 
and then you may have a couple other pages with news and blogs and other stuff. But basically, like, it's all there. You can get to wherever you need to go from the top menu. Your website should be aimed in the same direction. You're also going to want to start thinking about contact management. You want to be able to stay in touch on an informal way with a small circle of peers, friends, um, could be filmmakers, could be clients, you know, just be able to send them a, hey, how are you doing note every few months. The truth is, is that uh, when it's time to hire people, we are all a little lazy. And so we're going to probably go to a short list in our heads. And your chance of being on somebody's short list is directly proportional to how much contact time you've spent with them even if it's just an email every now and then saying, hey, here, I'm here. You know, it's hard to measure these things. And again, like 80% of your work is going to come from 20% of your contacts. But you definitely want to have some kind of system in place. You don't have to spend money on it, but some kind of system in place for maintaining a steady sort of back and forth dialogue with people. The other thing you want is a more general email list management tool. Uh, and I'm thinking now about MailChimp or Campaigner or Constant Contact, something that will uh, weed out, you know, spam email addresses and uh, defunct email addresses, uh, something that can manage email lists of at least 100 or more people to which you can send monthly or quarterly, however much, however many times you can stand uh, emails to. Uh, the emails should be a mix of things about what you're doing in your field and also maybe what other people are doing in their field or related topics. You don't want it to be 100% about you, nor do you want it to just be about other people. I've now been sending out chaotic sequence email blasts for more than 10 years, and I can't really say necessarily that it's led to me getting a ton of work. But on the other hand, uh, I have gotten at least some work from it that I know about for sure. And it has strengthened those bonds between me and other people. I find that when I'm posting about someone else's project in my email blast a month later, uh, that person will then post about something I've done. It's tempting at, at the beginning to spend money on office rent. And the truth is, is that an office can present you with some real advantages. If you have a somewhat chaotic home situation with, with not just not enough room uh, to have like to jam a home office in, having an office space of some kind can be a big advantage. It can also be a place where you can take clients. The thing is, is that as soon as you start paying rent, uh, office rent, um, you are also on some level working for the landlord. So, and you want to be very careful about that because in many jurisdictions, in many, in many cities and, and towns, there is no such thing as commercial rent control or stabilization. So if the landlord realizes, hey, I can, um, you know, I can get a Dwayne Reed in here and, and some more hi-fi clients, they'll just jack up your rent to the point where you can't pay it anymore. There are alternatives. There are co-working spaces. You can also join uh, collaborative filmmaker collaboratives um, that can give you a desk. You do want to at least consider setting up your office in a way that's comfortable for you to work in. If you can jam a desk somewhere in your apartment, that it's a comfortable desk to sit at, you know, where the keyboard is at the right height. Um, if you decide to get a standing desk, and I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, uh, I would say spend as little as possible because some of those are just tremendously, insanely expensive. But make sure that it's set up so that the monitor is at the right eye level. A lot of the problem I see with standing desks is that it's great that you're standing, but then you're bending your neck down to look at the screen, and that's not necessarily very helpful. Uh, make sure you can get a good chair. You know, a good chair can make a huge difference. These things don't have to cost a lot of money. You can get stuff from used furniture stores. You can do what I did. I scrounged a lot of my office furniture from the garbage or from companies that were throwing out their stuff. Over the years, I've built a home office setup that I'm fairly comfortable with and that I can work at for hours without getting too tired. You want to get good cases for your stuff. Something that can protect your gear should it get stuck in bad weather or get dinged, um, you know, or if you're flying a lot. 
cases are not cheap. Pelican cases are expensive, but they're expensive for a reason. If your lens gets dinged or scratched, even if you have insurance to cover it, you've still lost time on the set while you're waiting for a replacement. Does it make sense to get insurance for your gear, for your office setup, for your business? Or if you're going to be working as a crew person, do you rely on the production company to provide you with gear insurance? Honestly, if you're spending most of your time as a freelancer working for your clients, then the clients should provide you with insurance. That's my opinion, and not all clients will do that. Even if you're a cinematographer, you should think long and hard about camera purchases because camera equipment depreciates like crazy. Today's camera is tomorrow's doorstop it's going to be difficult for you to pay that equipment purchase off within the amount of time till the next great model comes that all the clients want. So it may make more sense, at least at first, to rent the gear that you're going out with. There are equipment rental houses that also work as purchasing houses. You know, so in other words, you can buy the equipment from them. And sometimes you can talk to them about this, about creating an arrangement wherein you can rent a camera and then buy that camera if you keep getting work. I think that's not necessarily the case with lenses. Lenses are a great investment, tripods, lights, sound mixing gear, and hair and makeup kits, uh, steamers. You know, those things tend to, you tend to be able to use those things year after year. Now, if you are good at accounting and you are trained and know how to keep books for your business, that's great. I am not. I have QuickBooks and I keep my expenses separate. I try to categorize my expenses, but when it comes to tax time, I hand all that stuff off to an accountant to make sure that I'm paying the correct amount of taxes and deducting the right amount of deductions. Do I want to spend money on this or do I want to do it myself? I feel like taxes is something where I just... I seem to be incapable of really absorbing all of the information necessary and also tax law changes every year. So I, I feel like my time is better spent going off and chasing paying work than doing my taxes. So another class of people that you may want to consider hiring at some point in your career is people who are specialists in marketing and branding. You want to vet these folks very carefully and make sure that they actually can provide real services, uh, obviously get references from previous clients. Um, you know, there's a lot of sort of guruism out there and people who claim that they can help you drive your sales numbers up through the roof. If they're promising something that's too good to be true, it probably is. You may want to have uh, experts come in and edit your reel uh, or edit uh, or create your business cards or create your website. Really get to know the person. A lot of these kinds of things are about the relationship you have with the other person as much as it is about their technical skill. I'm also very leery of play to pay situations. So the way it works is this. You pay X amount of dollars to pitch over the phone to somebody or over the web to somebody at some management company or agency for 10 minutes, let's say. Or let's say you uh, pay money to take an audition class where basically you're auditioning for casting directors or casting associates. You're basically paying to interview for a job. Think about that for a minute. The truth is, is that if you want to pitch to companies, it is it is difficult to sometimes get to the right people, but the people you're pitching to over the web are not necessarily the people who can make any kind of decisions anyway. So you know, tread carefully, really do your research on companies that are offering these services. You should never pay an agent or a manager the managers or agents are supposed to get money from a percentage of the sales of your work. If they are charging you an upfront fee, like a reading fee, or if they're charging you to represent them, then they are not managers or agents. They are scamming you. The truth about this business is that there's never a still point where you can say, oh, I've learned enough, I'm done, I know enough now. It's worth at least looking around at what the local filmmaker resources are near you. There are lots of alliances and small co-ops that are around the country that are worth uh, checking out and maybe getting membership into uh, that will offer you, you know, low to no cost classes and seminars. Um, networking opportunities, uh, pitch events, uh, screenings, 
These are all ways for you to connect with local filmmaking community members who can then help you get work or at least uh, help you uh, deal with business and technical questions and also learn more about the industry. So Movie Maker Magazine and full disclosure, I've written for Movie Maker, uh, has good articles how, on how-to stuff. Also Pro Video Coalition, disclaimer, I've written for them as well. If all this sounds really super intimidating to you, don't worry, you don't have to go out and take care of all this stuff tomorrow just so you can open up your shop. So it's worth taking a little bit of time out every month or every couple months even to just sit down and say, how, what am I spending money on that I should be spending money on? What are things that I shouldn't be spending money on? Am I directing my time and my, my money, my resources into areas that are gonna help me grow my business? or at least maintain my business versus things that are just not productive or not working out. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Bye.